<clears throat> Goodness, open the meeting of the Deerfield Planning Board on today, Monday, April 5th, 2021 at 7.01 p.m. With a reminder that meetings normally held at the municipal offices are now being held remotely, but with adequate alternate means of public access and where required public participation provided. And we have evidence of that this evening already. Uh, and this is in accordance with the governor's order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law. And um, I, we should be having FCAT broadcast today and the remote meeting connections are noted on the agenda on the website site at deerfieldma.us. Um, roll call members. So we do not have Paul today, Max Antis. <clears throat> Is unmuting and will tell us if he's present. He is Max Santi's present. Excellent. Hi, Max. Rachel Blaine. To Blaine present. And Mary Cloutier. And Mary Cloutier present. Denise Mason. Denise Mason present. Kathy Watroba. Kathy Watroba present. And Annalie Wilkel present. So we do have a quorum, and today our majority meeting, uh, majority for the voting will be four. So we're set for that. Okay. Um, I don't believe we had any mail today. Jennifer, am I corrected on that? I don't, I don't think so. Right? No mail. So maybe we'll scoot on Anne Mary two minutes. We have minutes from 3-1 and 3-22. Okie dokie. Uh, there we go. Um, has everyone had a chance to read them? And if so, can we just go ahead and I move to approve um, both the minutes from uh, 322 and I'm sorry. 31. Just looking at it. 31. Right. Can we have a second? A second, Denise Mason. Right. Um, and let's see. In favor, Max. Max Santi's aye. Uh, Rachel. Rachel Blaine aye. And Mary. Well, you moved, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. And Mary Clue, your aye. <laughs> Denise. Right. Denise Mason aye. Kathy. Kathy Wittroba aye. And Annalie aye. Uh, so unanimously approved. Okay. And so now we're moving right into, we do have, as needless to say, a very um, fun packed agenda, but hey, we'll do it right. We'll begin with this ANR uh, for 51 Sugar, Sugarloaf Street. And um, I don't know if we have someone who is um, representing the ANR or if we, um, if not, uh, maybe, uh, if there is any discussion, is there anyone here representing the um, the A and R? Apparently not. I don't see anybody. Nope. Okay. So, um, well, let's see, Jen. This is the one from that we had on the board from January. No, January, February. Ah, uh, well, but we have a situation. We've not discussed it. To, I don't. I don't believe. And nobody's here to present. We won Sugarloaf Street. Yeah. Is that um, unusual or a requirement? No, I don't think it's a requirement. It's just unusual. Huh. Okay. Well, why don't we, can I make a motion that we table this until we have a representative from the applicant? Uh, Madam Chair? Yeah. Madam Chair, if I could just throw in my two cents. Totally so. um, the uh, the board once submitted the board has 21 days to approve an A and R plan, so if you don't approve it within 21 days, it's deemed approved uh, in any event. So the board needs to determine whether or not there's adequate frontage and adequate area, um, and uh, that's what your determination is. So uh, I you know there's no requirement that the applicant <laughs> present. I don't have the A and R in front of me. I just wanted to make sure. That the board didn't fall into an automatic approval if the if the ANR didn't meet those requirements. We may have. Yeah, I think we're pretty close, right? If not, have we passed it already, Jen? Do you know? I don't have the application in front of me. Do you have it? Is it I do. 
I do. It is, let's see here. It was uh, March 8th. Oops. Oh. So, and today's yeah. April 5th. So the board should ought to um, ought to so they don't file for constructive approval. The board ought to at least uh, review the plan and make its determination. So the question is, um, I don't the lots that are shown on the plan. Do they have adequate area and adequate um, frontage on a uh, road, public way or private way um, that's passable? Bob, did you want to speak on this behalf? We both took a look at this plan, so. Hey, Bob. <clears throat> Bob? I didn't, is Bob here? I didn't see him. Yeah, I'm here. Can you enlarge yeah. it for me? I, yep. I looked at it a while, like a long time ago. I know, that's what I'm thinking. Okay, there we go. How's yeah. that? I believe they were just adding land to this corner lot, and this is an unbuildable area back here. I can't, I, I looked at it like a, a month ago. That's, I feel like we've had. <laughs> I, was, yeah. I mean, I was a little confused because they talked about parcel one, parcel two, lot A, lot B, and parcel 23 and 24. I think it, it seems, is that little boomerang area is the- This movie? is my word. The, the part A is just being added to that corner lot, I believe. To the and B one. is being separated off, which is not buildable. But. Could you say that in a different way? I'm sorry. The part marked A. Part marked right. A. Right there, A, the A. Right there. Uh, yes, the whole thing, or is it that just that, the whole thing there? Okay. No, I believe it's those lines and that within the A section. This little, one? It's like a weird triangle, like a boomerang. It looks like. Yeah. This. Yes. Okay. That part is being added to that corner lot. So it's making a non-conforming lot less non-conforming, even though it's still, cause see, see how the tip, remember, um, Annalie, I was just telling you that how it's touching the property line. If you're looking at it on the right-hand side. Correct. So you're just adding more property to it. It's not making it a conforming lot, but it's making it less non-conforming. And there's adequate frontage on um, on the other lot there, and then the back lot is just not it won't won't have any frontage. Okay. And it says it's not a buildable lot, right? Are there any other questions? Thank you, Bob and Jen. Appreciate. It. Mm -hmm. um, well, if we don't have any other questions could we have a motion to endorse the ANR for 51 Sugarloaf can I just clarify it's just adding property to an already non-conforming or a, a odd lot right yeah. yes that's the way I saw it yeah <laughs> okay this is why it's nice to have somebody come along with it because we don't we don't um the the it doesn't speak on its own. And it's great that we have Jen and we don't always get to have, I mean, it's great that Bob's here, but anyway. So the little dotted lines are where they're changing the changing. property line. Yeah. And yeah. It just right, seems well, like a, an unusual addition. That's all. Yeah. Well, yeah, she's just consolidating. Yeah, I think, Bob? I, I believe they sold the, I think the property changed hands, so they were trying to reconfigure the lot. Was all they were trying to do? Yeah. Well, I move that we endorse the ANR um, at. Um, I just lost the address. Somebody help me out here. Oh, Fifty One Sugarloaf. Fifty One Sugarloaf Street. <clears throat> May we have a second? I'll second that. Hey, Mayor Cloutier, I second that. Thanks, Anne Mary. Um, so next. I think you need to vote on that, Madam Chair. Oh, yeah. we're, we're, we'll have a vote then. We say we have a vote. Is that what we say? Yeah, starting with Max. All right, Max, you're the first to vote. Uh, Max, Auntie's aye. <clears throat> Rachel? Rachel Blaine, aye. Anne Mary? Anne Mary Cloutier, aye. Denise? 
Ms. Mason, aye. Kathy? Oops, Kathy. Ooh, Kathy. I was muted. Kathy Wachoba, aye. <laughs> Thanks, Kathy. And Emily, sure. aye. Okay, so it passes unanimously. Great. <clears throat> So now we're in the fun of our bylaw review and we want to welcome um, Lisa, uh, this Lisa Mead, um, who has been helpful uh, talking to Chris and also some lots of good um, emails. But I, for people who have not met, have every, has everyone met Lisa? Tonight was my first night. So Lisa's famous in our town. <laughs> Well, here you go. go. To all of our special time, our meetings. Right, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Lisa. <laughs> I know <Yeah>. that. <laughs> okay. Um, so tonight we have three, actually three bylaws that we have, that we want to go through in anticipation of public meetings. <clears throat> and the first one actually is accessory apartments which we did um, vote for public meeting and it has been posted for next Monday night. Um, however, I do understand that um, we can make changes prior to the public meeting and have those changes posted um, prior to the public hearing. Um, but um, uh, Chris and Lisa reviewed the accessory apartment bylaw and as Chris mentioned in an overview email, there was some concern about the section, I think it's uh, 3941, about whether or not we actually need to instruct prior owners of what to do about complying with our new bylaws. So Chris and Lisa, if you want to elaborate. Um, Madam okay. Chair, if I could just talk about a process for a second. For oh, a excellent. Sure. So, um, and what triggered it was, um, your comment relative to your public hearing next week. So I'm not sure how many members of the planning board have participated in uh, zoning bylaw changes uh, um, or not. But uh, when you change a zoning bylaw, um, it's a little different than just about any other bylaw change or regulatory change in town. So zoning bylaw change requires an advertisement uh, in the newspaper. Um, and then of course, uh, to be put on the warrant. Um, but the thing about the zoning bylaw change is it by and large has to be advertised as it's going to be adopted. Um, if there are substantive changes, it's not sufficient just to post on the website those changes, uh, but it would need to be re-advertised if, if there were substantive changes that impacted uh, an individual's property rights. So I'm not really sure where you are in the process. My understanding was that in fact, uh, you were kind of working through this prior to uh, the advertisement, but if I am wrong about that, uh, then we need to have a conversation relative to uh, the advertising, whether or not any of these changes are substantive changes. So I just wanted to, to say that uh, right up front because uh, zoning bylaws are a little different than uh, the rest of uh, changes that occur to bylaws um, for the town. Okay. okay well, I did check the website today and it um, has been advertised for a public hearing on April 12th. Um, in the newspaper, and the newspaper has printed these bylaws, uh, as proposed. So that's it. You mean that they need to be, they need to be printed in advance. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Jen, can you confirm? All I saw was what was on, posted on the website. I didn't see anything in the newspaper. No, I don't believe the bylaw was posted in the paper. Just the announcement for the meeting. So the process, it's, and it's not unusual to do this, right? So this is actually, if it hasn't been printed, that's good. Um, because you typically, particularly in bylaws like this, um, where there's a lot of back and forth, you wanna have that back and forth before you actually advertise it. Cause what you don't wanna do is advertise it and then have substantive changes and then have to advertise it again. So I think that you, your public hearing to discuss this um, may have been advertised, but then what you want to do to actually advertise it properly under 40A section five prior to considering it to be on the warrant, um, that's a different um, different can of worms. So I just wanted to, to talk about that process before we jumped into the substance of the 
articles themselves. So Lisa, does the advertisement of the actual wording of the bylaws, does that have to also be two weeks in advance? Um, yeah, it's under 40A section five, it's two, uh, it's at least two weeks in advance twice um, each week. Well, once each week, tw you know, twice prior to the, to the meeting. Okay, so mm -hmm. what that means is that in fact, we won't be having our public hearing next, unless we, unless we don't change the bylaws, we won't be having our public hearing next week. No, we will have our, our public hearing. It's just that in advance of the public, uh, the, the town meeting, right? Yeah, you want to re-advertise. So you can have your public hearing, right? You can have a public hearing to talk about these bylaws. And then if there are, even if there are substantive changes then, then what you're going to do is actually after that meeting, the board is going to decide what it is that they're going to move forward with, right? So let's say the board decides not to move forward with the uh, solar access bylaw, right? Which there are big issues with. So you're not going to, you don't want to advertise that if you're not going to move forward with it, right? So you just, after you hear everybody's input, then you're going to get a draft that you think is pretty close to being final. Then I would advertise that you have your public hearing under 40A section five for that. And then following that we have town meeting. Okay. Got it. <laughs> Although if we do make some changes now, we will still need to have an additional public hearing. Oh yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. Okay, so we can, uh, if it's all right with you, Madam Chair, maybe Chris and I can walk through the um, accessory apartment bylaw. Okay. So um, the board is right on top of things. You know, there was an accessory apartment change um, under the uh, under governor's uh, new legislation that passed about a month and a half ago. Um, and y'all and Christopher uh, took advantage of that and cleaned up your accessory apartment um, bylaw revisions. Um, my one of the things that Christopher and I looked at um, was making sure that any definitions you had in here were consistent with the definitions that you had in the rest of the bylaw and if they weren't to make it clear that they only were applicable to this section. Um, and um, so I don't know Christopher you want to um, the, the biggest thing for me when I first reviewed this um, was two things. Um, one, if if a person ha is uh, using a property and they have an accessory apartment today that's been legal, okay, under your current bylaw, um, then it's continuing as non-conforming. You can't make them, you can't make them now reapply if you use zoning to do that, right? Because zoning only affects those things moving forward, right? Under 40A section six, paragraph one, we have pre-existing non-conforming uses and structures. So if a person's accessory apartment was legal today, you can't now make them apply for a special permit for an accessory apartment moving forward. If you did a license for accessory apartments, which you're not proposing to do under the general bylaws, you could kind of sweep all that up, but you can't. So anybody who's using an accessory apartment today so long as it's legal today, it's going to be legal moving forward without applying for a special permit. Yes, Rachel. A question on, um, we talked a little bit last meeting about registering um, accessory apartments with the building inspector. Um, is that, that's not licensing. Well, you would have to do that under a general bylaw. You would have to would do that. Have to do that. Bylaw. Right. And it would be, you can call it licensing, you can call it registering, whatever you want but it would have to be under a general bylaw. It couldn't be under the zoning, okay? So that would be something we might, because we talked about that last time, we might think about that, might put, discuss that. Well, it, you may want to talk about that with the, with the Board of Health um, and mm -hmm. the building inspector, right? Because it would have to really fall under that kind of purview as opposed well, to zoning. It, I mean, we talked about it with our building inspector just to make it simpler. And also it would keep track of those pri you know, previously legal right. ones previously not legal ones that would then now potentially fall into the you know under the right and, and as well as ones moving forward that would be built in yep but as rachel says previously ones that maybe aren't legal or 
Well, if they aren't legal, then they're not protected as non-conforming. 40A section six paragraph one says, any new zoning bylaw or ordinance shall not apply to a, a use lawfully in existence or structurally lawfully in existence at the time of the adoption of the zoning bylaw, right? So if it wasn't lawfully in existence, then you can sweep it up in any new changes because it wasn't lawful. But if it was lawful, it's pre-existing non-conforming, okay? So the only way we would know that is if someone reports it. Right. right. It's not, I mean, it's, you know, it's tough, right? You don't have Bob going out and knocking on everybody's door. That looks like they have an extra door in the back of the house, right? He's not allowed to do that unless he really has a reason for it, nor does he have the time. Um, so that was one of the big changes. We, we removed the, the stuff that you had about kind of sweeping those up into um, bringing up to code. Uh, additionally, you can't require... The building code part of that is really Bob. It's not zoning, right? So the zoning complies with zoning. Building code is a Bob thing and you can't make somebody through zoning comply with building. That's a Bob thing. So we remove that um, from the proposed bylaw that you had provided to us. Um, and then um, Christopher changed the, de the definitions like we discussed. So I'm not sure, Christopher, do we, uh, did I miss anything there? No, I think you hit the, the main points. The only other one was that um, we had included the uh, definitions twice in the bylaw, once to be included in the bylaw itself and, and a second time to be um, included in the broader definition section of the town zoning bylaw. And uh, Lisa felt that that was not the appropriate way to do that. So that section at the end of the bylaw with the second set of definitions has also been deleted. So Lisa, you think that including it with the bylaw where it is applicable, might as well just put it in at the at one place. Is that what you're saying? Right. You don't, you don't need to double up. I, you know, um, uh, Casey and I talked about the fact that we really need to do a recodification. Um, and it, it, as part of that process, we would sweep up all the definitions. And well, they would all be in one place. You, right. you run right. the risk of changing in one place and not in another. Right, exactly. But for the purposes of this right now, um, we're not doing a recodification. Um, and you might as well have it within the bylaw. And um, Christopher made sure that they didn't conflict with the existing definitions. Any other questions? All righty. So, um, I think what we now, well, I guess if we're still in discussion, so what what we do need, need to do now is we're revising these bylaws. So we will need to um, post. So what I would do before your public hearing, so everybody's singing off the same sheet of music, I would post on your website what, what you all decide tonight. Let's say it's this now revised accessory apartment and tell everybody this is what we're going to be talking about at the net, at our hearing, and this is what we want to move forward with for an official advertisement and consideration of town meeting, right? And then after your public hearing, if there's you know, if, if you have major changes to it or not, that's the document you want to move forward to because then at your actual public hearing that's been advertised with the with the uh, bylaw in the newspaper, you should only have minor edits to it and no substantive changes. Lisa, could I just ask you for a clarification about that, that, that second public hearing that you're describing now with the bylaw advertised? Do you, is it your opinion that the town must advertise the entire text of the bylaw in the newspaper? So, you know, we do it a couple of different ways, depending on how long the bylaw is. The Zoning Act would prefer you to have the entire bylaw, but that is actually sometimes not appropriate, right? So what you would do is advertise the, by, the proposed bylaw, what sections it is, and the headings, right? And all of the headings. And then say uh, the exact language is available for review at the town clerk's office and at, on the website but you at least need to advertise the headings and the section numbers and the section you're amending. That's very helpful, thank you. You're welcome.
basically. All right, so um, can we go forward with uh, just one vote to accept the changes as recommended or we don't have to go through and vote on every individual change? Oh no, you can, you can just vote as recommended if you want, that's for now. Yeah. So I would so move, I would move that we uh, move forward with the current, the bylaws as changed in this discussion um, to present next Friday, next Monday at a public hearing. Second that. Thank you, Denise. You're welcome. Um, and so let's have a vote. Um, Max Antes. Max, aunties, no. Rachel Blaine. Rachel Blaine, yes. Anne Mary Cloutier. Anne Mary Cloutier, yes. Denise Mason. Denise Mason, yes. Kathy Retro Retroba. Uh, Kathy Retroba, yes. And Annalie Wolfcool, yes. So it's passed, what is it, the five one five one zero, right? Can I ask Max what your concerns are? Oh, to be um, the off street parking and stick it, you know, if number nine, it, it should have two spaces and parking in the street really isn't, shouldn't be an option or on even on the table because we have a parking ban hmm. in the winter months. And to me, an accessory apartment to, uh, to help the primary resident only needs one bedroom and perhaps two unrelated adults. You know, otherwise it, you're just do it, it's just turning into a full blown duplex. If you're going with two bedrooms and three unrelated uh, adults, you know, it's, it's reaching beyond what its intent was to me. Helpful to know, Max. Thank you. Good. Uh, the parking issue is going to be one that we'll have to contend with. Right, but just to Hi take there. it off. My, um... Take it off the planning board as being, you know, let's just say our, you know, you got to have two places to park, and that's that. Um, Max, I will mention that we we did remove the section on um, unrelated adults. That was one of the sections we took out at an earlier um, meeting. Okay, no, I'm just going by the copy I've got printed out. But I might not be up to date on all the versions. All right, um, should we move on to solar? Uh, Lisa and- I'm sorry, I need, I, my internet is a little iffy and I need to know who, um, moved and who seconded that last vote, please. Rachel, Rachel moved and Denise seconded. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Um, solar, Chris and Lisa. So Chris, you wanna, you wanna start this one or do you want me sure. to? Sure, sure. Um, so we again um, had discussion about the draft that the board had um, produced and the, the focus of the discussion was really around the section on solar access, which as, as we discussed several times has been problematic. Um, it's been brought up that it's difficult to figure out how to enforce that section. Um, and even though the Zoning Act under Chapter 40A has a section in it on solar access, it seems that not many communities in Massachusetts, if any, have really successfully drafted bylaws to address that um, issue. So there was some concern um, about whether this might be subject to legal challenges or enforcement issues. Um, and ultimately after discussing it at length with Lisa, we felt like, um, the best option would be to take it out for now, um, do further research on this issue, see whether or not we can come up with some language at a future date that might more successfully address the issue. But for now, um, it seemed like the best option to push forward with the solar 
bylaw without that section in it. Um, so that was the most significant change. Uh, there were also some changes in section 38954 um, where Lisa suggested providing additional forms of surety as options. I thought that was very helpful. And similarly to the accessory apartment bylaw, we deleted the second set of definitions in the bylaw and made clear that there were some definitions that applied only to this specific section of the bylaw. So those were the primary changes. There were some other smaller ones. Um, can, I, um, can I just, add, I want to add a couple of things. So first of all, I want to uh, commend the town. I think that uh, Deerfield, uh, not surprisingly, has always been at the forefront of really um, pushing uh, green energy and um, environmentally friendly ways to develop and, and things of that nature. So, um, and we're obviously going to talk a little bit more about that in site plan review. Um, as Christopher said, there is a provision in 40A, um, section nine, that allows for solar access. Um, we talked a little bit about the history of that. Um, that provision along with uh, 40A section three, paragraph nine, was added under Governor Dukakis, interestingly enough. Um, and even uh, paragraph nine of 40A3, which are the exemptions for large scale solar facilities, actually doesn't have any case law behind it. Um, it's been a very difficult thing to implement. And the reason is this, is if you can imagine this, you buy a piece of property and you're, you know what your dimensional requirements are for your property, right? And so does your neighbors. Now imagine that you're gonna buy your piece of property and maybe depending on what your neighbor does next door, it might impact how you use your property either negatively or positively. And the example I gave to Chris is, what if I, what if you have what if you, what if you have neighbors that are not getting along, right? And so I stick one solar panel in the back corner of my property, and then I've stopped you from doing something on your property that you otherwise would be allowed to do uh, by right under the zoning. And so I, we really in Massachusetts we haven't quite got there yet, but I think that um, we're on the verge of doing that. And I just like a little bit more time to work with Christopher to find something that actually will work and won't get kicked back. Um, because if we're gonna do this work and you really want it to happen, we should do it right. And um, so I have um, I've committed to Christopher and to Casey um, to take a look at this. Um, I just, I don't think it's quite there. Um, there's a lot of good ideas there that come from other states, um, but those states have different kinds of zoning uh, or uh, excuse me, zoning statutes than uh, Massachusetts has. We're very parochial here in Massachusetts. Um, as you know, we have 351 different zoning ordinances and bylaws in the state and uh, many other states, particularly on the West Coast and in the Midwest have a zoning act that everybody follows. Um, it's not separate um, based upon jurisdiction. So uh, we're gonna work on that um, for you and we'll be back to you with that. Um, a couple of other things, uh, minor changes, and this is just a drafting thing overall because I, I've seen this a couple of times and it's not just uh, with Deerfield, but it's with some other folks. So <clears throat> when you have special permits, um, you say uh, in your general administration section, uh, special permits will be granted by X, let's call it the planning board, uh, unless the bylaw otherwise says, okay? And so instead of, referring to either the zoning board or the select board, or the planning board throughout the bylaw, what you refer to is the special permit granting authority, right? And so at the beginning of the, of the particular provision of the bylaw, in this instance, the solar provision, you just say, in this instance, the special permit granting authority shall be the planning board. And then throughout the rest of the section, you just use the word special permit granting authority. It doesn't take away your right or authority. It's just a drafting issue and it's a consistency issue. So in this instance, um, I, I was, uh, I, a couple of times we went back and Christopher and I talked about this. The planning board is the special permit granting authority for this, but we use the term special permit granting authority, right? So that's how you're proposing this. Um, and it wasn't to, to take away your authority to do it, but it's just a drafting issue uh, in that regard. And then finally, um, just as a matter of practice and um, the, the planning board can, or the town can write uh, bylaws relative to 
small scale solar facilities that are ground mounted, large scale solar facilities that are ground mounted, some of which you need to um, allow by right under 40A section three, paragraph nine. But the ones that are on rooftops, those are building code issues, okay? They're not within your purview. So I did make some changes throughout the bylaw relative to that. Um, so um, those would be the only things I wanted to point out other than what Christopher already said. Let's have some discussion. Any questions for Lisa or Chris? Denise? No, I was gonna make a motion to table this until Lisa and Chris have more time to fully explore what the changes should be. Well, um, if I could jump in for a second, my um, suggestion to you would be um, that it may take some time to work on the solar access provisions. What I had envisioned was that we would come back to you at a future date with a solar access bylaw amendment, but that you would uh, be able to move forward with the solar bylaw as it stands without the solar access provisions, because it's a very important bylaw and has a lot of provisions that are, are timely. And, and really our, our major overall goal with this bylaw was to um, make it easier to do solar in Deerfield. Um, we we're trying to make clear that there are certain by right solar uses and, and clarify the provisions for, for advancing solar projects. So I guess I would separate the solar bylaw from the solar access um, issue and suggest to you the possibility of moving forward with the bylaw uh, as it stands now without um, the solar access component to it. Yeah, I, I would agree. I, so long as you remove the solar access part of this, um, you're merely modifying the existing bylaw you have, A, to make it clear, B, to make it clear that certain things are allowed by right. Um, if that's the, you know, the position the town wants to end up taking. Um, but, you know, it, it's a typical thing for a town meeting to consider absent the solar access. I cannot support it if solar access stays a part of it. And it sounded to me as if you were saying it's not just that you don't have time now before time meet, town meeting to research it. It's that we're also waiting to find out what happens in other towns and how it rolls out. Mm -hmm. Well, and let me be clear also, I'm not afraid to be the first, right, at all. Um, that's the last thing I'm afraid to do. But if I'm going to be the first, I want to make it right. And it's not there yet. We don't have a we don't have a bylaw that would be approved by the attorney general uh, under the solar access provision. I think we discovered this in our discussion. There are so many complexities um, between neighbors solar access. I mean, somebody was uh, talking to me the other day about solar easements. Um, <clears throat> there are just a lot of opportunity here that are is we just need to keep looking at what's it. Right. How do and we regulate the sun? access to the sun right so rachel that's a really interesting thing you know and we we don't need to harp on this but if neighbors gave each other solar easements right because they bought and sold them or traded them or did whatever well that's different right that's different than imposing it in a bylaw different different from the underlying you know zoning requirements so solar easements all day long are great because those are bought and sold, you know, that's fine. Those are people doing what with their property, what they choose to do. There's clarity about it. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I think that's also where, um, Bob, it was very helpful in some of our discussions when you brought forward some of the questions and issues, especially in relation to in enforcement. I think that was very illustrative to me. Right. How challenging this is. Yes. Um, other discussion? Okay, I think we need to have um, two votes. I might, um, the first one would be to vote on this draft to go forward to a public hearing. And then the second one would be to set the public hearing. I'd like to hold off on setting the public hearing until we get through maybe with the solar and we vote on those calendar issues all at once if that works for people. Okay, so could I have a motion to um, vote that this draft. I'm going to move to endorse the solar zoning bylaws without the solar access provision. And as also just 
revised and cleaned up in the last draft we received? Well, right. Um, I'm assuming that both the last conversation and this conversation it, are following the same process, right? They're going to be cleaned up, they're going to be advertised, and yeah. then we're going to get hearing dates. That was my understanding of process. Please, somebody tell me if I don't have that right. I believe so. That's right. correct. Okay. Um, can I have a second? I'll second that, Denise Mason. Thanks, Denise. Um, so, um, votes. Um, Max? Max, Antes, uh, yes. Thank you, Rachel. Rachel Blaine, yes. And Mary? And Mary Cloutier, yes. Denise? Denise Mason, yes. Kathy? Kathy Wittropa, yes. And Emily Wolf Cool, yes. So it passes with the majority vote. And we'll hold off at this moment for voting on setting the public hearing date uh, after we have our site plan review discussion, which is next. So Lisa and Chris, no rest for the weary. So um, I'm gonna kick this off and then I'll let um, Christopher uh, pop into this. So um, this, was, uh, this was a lot um, because now you have um, added uh, the uh, list, whole section on uh, green, what's it called? Green- Development Performance Standards. Green Development Performance Standards. And so um, when I got this, um, uh, both uh, given uh, my partner Adam's recent uh, work with you all on a site plan review matter um, and um, the, the document that Chris gave me, um, they were, it was all kind of uh, mushed together, so to speak. So um, what we did was kind of help reorganize it. Um, and for the you have this green development standards special permit that people get bonuses on if they follow it. That's really a special permit. So we pulled that out and set it aside as second. We didn't take it away. We just made it clear that that was a special permit somebody could apply for. But then we also added to the criteria um, that Christopher had done. Um, we made it clear that in addition to your regular criteria, traffic, lighting, storm water, that now you have this green performance standards as well, right? And the thing that I wanted to make clear is that in performance standards, it's not a shall always, right? It's to the best that you can achieve something because there's some pretty high standards in here. And so, um, and then ultimately it's a determination based upon the application before you. So. We um, reviewed that for that particular um, provision. And then um, what we really tried to do in my mind from a process point of view is clean up the application process, right? So that it's clear that your time to consider an application starts once you receive a complete application, right? So you're not gonna accept an incomplete application, because if you do, your time starts, right? So you're gonna get an application. If it's not complete, the time doesn't start. It doesn't start until you've been submitted a complete application. So that was, that was really important. Um, and what has to be a part of that application process and how long you have to consider an application, right? Because I'm sure you all know that site plan review doesn't really exist under a 40A, right? It's kind of this thing that has grown and developed by practice of municipalities and the land court and SJC has said it's okay, but it doesn't really exist there. It's this administrative thing. So we wanted to be clear about how many days you had to consider um, a site plan review, okay? And then Christopher, uh, did yeoman's efforts at trying to argue with me about your section 5446, which is a uh, precedence of site plan decision. So let me, let me talk to you, I'm gonna back up and talk about big picture for a minute, right? An application comes in and let's say it's, uh, 
it requires a, a zoning special permit, it requires site plan review, and it requires an order of conditions, all right? Now, under chapter 138, which is the state wetlands protection law, okay, that law says that the Conservation Commission can require an applicant to apply for every other permit before it comes to them. That's what the state law says, right? Now, aside from expedited permitting, there's no other state law that says you have to go get site plan review first, or you have to get a variance first, or you have to get a special permit from the plant from the zoning first. What does exist is that you have to get something from everyone that you're required to get. And it doesn't matter what order it's in, they're all of equal importance, right? And if you get a plan that's approved by the planning board, and then they go to the zoning board and the zoning board says, oh, no, no, I, I want you to have, you know, 15 more parking spaces, let's say, right? And that applicant has closed down the planning board hearing. Well, the applicant has to go back to the planning board and make his plan comply with what the planning board says, all right? So my concern about this section, precedence of site plan, you know, the town, town meeting can say, yeah, I, I guess we're going to make you do that, but that violates state law under 138, the Wetlands Protection Act, right? Because the Wetlands Protection Act says, wait a minute, I want them to apply for and see where they are with the planning board before they come to me, right? So it, this provision is confusing for applicants. It has caused and will continue to cause problems amongst boards and certainly defending positions and timing. And so, you know, you all can do what you want with this section personally. I think it should be stricken, period, because they have to comply with everything they're supposed to comply with. It doesn't matter. And if they're, you know, if an applicant is foolish enough to go to another board and close out their permit, and then come to the planning board and the planning board says, we want you to change all these things. Well, too bad for them. They got to go back to the other boards and now change what they've already gotten closed out. Typically what you would do is file with somebody all at the same time, right? And the applicant goes board to board and tries to get a plan that meets everybody's requirements. And then they close it out, but they don't have to. They could close it out after one, but they will have to come back and modify it if it's not the same. So I say that because I know Christopher has said to me that this board is very concerned about this section and I respect that. But I just want the board to know from a legal point of view, it doesn't matter, right? And quite frankly, 138 takes precedence over this. And it is the source of a lot of confusion. So, you know, I'm happy to, I'm happy to take the board's comments and hear your concerns about it. Um, but for me, you know, Christopher made all the other changes that we thought were really good from an organizational point of view in here, which is really mostly what happened was organization. And there wasn't a lot of substance that was changed. Um, organization and tightening up the application process and things like that. I think, uh, and Christopher, tell me if I'm wrong. I think this is really the only substantive thing that we disagreed on in here. Yes, that's right. And I'm not saying that we even disagreed. I think that there were just different perspectives on this and I was trying to represent the board's perspective um, and concerns, which, you know, I think were, were also, you know, valid issues and, and it's difficult. As you said, it's a difficult issue to try to come to a, a, a good closure on. Um, I, there were a couple of other minor changes, which I'll mention, but I think maybe we should talk about this one first before I go into those. Yep. We have some discussion. Well, we've long struggled with the order, order of operations um, and have tried to actually solve that by meeting sometimes together with other boards um, at the same time so that we're hearing um, a proposal that two boards, zoning board and planning board or CONCOM and planning board um, can hear and um, look at a proposal together. Um, that's just not been particularly feasible. And now it sounds like it's not even that sensible actually. 
but it was certainly saved time for the applicant in, in terms of being trying to be more um, friendly to the applicants and their concerns about time and their experts, et cetera. You know, um, you do have under the expedited provisions, uh, expedited permitting provisions that uh, you all have in the bylaws, uh, that was under a um, uh, legislative uh, permit that you could hold hearings together. There's nothing to say that you couldn't encourage an applicant that if they wanted to hold a joint public hearing and the boards were able to do that, that you could do that. Now, you both retain your control you both retain, you both have to open up your hearings, you know, you both have to have minutes. Uh, and then, you know, maybe you have an initial meeting that's together and then you kind of go your um, separate ways. Um, you can say in here that applicants are encouraged to, uh, you know, where projects overlap um, various jurisdictions that they're encouraged to uh, attempt to meet together, but not required to do so. Um, you, there's nothing to say that you can't do something like that. The, my, the language here that's really troublesome is that, you know, that you order the building inspector in this bylaw, right, not to issue a building permit or have a special permit or variant issued uh, without written approval or site plan by the planning board. I mean, that starts to become a, a huge issue on a number of, of levels. So um, I, I get the whole, uh, you know, and believe me, I, I represent applicants up and around this neck of the woods. And let me tell you that it'd be nice to have boards all sitting around the table because otherwise sometimes you feel like a ping pong ball, right? Um, so you could do that. You can, there's nothing to say that you couldn't encourage an applicant to file and seek a, a joint public hearing to open up or, you know, the zoning board can't really do this and you can't really do it as the special permit granting authority, but you could have from site plan review is to have a preliminary meeting, right? You could have a preliminary informal meeting prior to an application being filed and say, you know, we want to hear you. Now you can't really do that for special permits and you can't no. really do that. Uh, the zoning board can't really do that, but this board for site plan review, you certainly could have a preliminary hearing, you know, think about it as a subdivision, right? You have a preliminary subdivision, then definitive. So you could actually encourage. And we um, have done that. Yeah. 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 So you can, you can do that too. That's helpful because then they can take your feedback, right? And then go over to the zoning board or the whatever conservation commission and say, we've met preliminarily with the planning board and here's what they say. Now at those meetings, to be fair to the applicants, you got to tell them what you think, right? You, you know, I've been in front of enough boards that they say, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then all of a sudden you appear back in front of them and they're like, wow, I want to do, you know, you have to tell people what you think in those meetings if you're going to do that. But I, it's, um, this provision is a problem. And I, I think that's my opinion on it. Um, and if you're going to redo the bylaw, my goal is always to make it better. Other discussion? Well, this is why I thought it was going to be so contentious. There you go. As I think it was about wrangling some power. And I think, you know, what, um, I, it, it, fewer meetings isn't necessarily better. Better meetings are better. So, I, I, you know, I think that that's probably where we're, we're headed. Trevor? Thank you, Rachel. Thank you for allowing me to speak. Um, I think I, I understand where the frustration comes from and, you know, not seeing, you know, seeing how applicants maybe um, strategically go after different boards and kind of mess up the whole process. And I think, although, although I do think there are applicants, you know, that I have been talking to or have talked to in the past that will really um, be grateful for a roadmap. So I think encouraging a roadmap of saying, look, you have a project that's gonna affect all three boards. We recommend you do this, have a preliminary meeting for site plan and review. You know, if you lay out a roadmap for them that is not required, but is recommended, um, it, gives, it gives the developer who really wants to come to our community and invest in our community and grow our tax base to, uh, or whatever it might be, um, 
gives them a, you know, a good roadmap on, um, okay, what are you all looking for? What do I have to do? And, um, you know, some may be experienced, some, some not. So some may play the game, which we've had and seen. Um, but I think if you're able to uh, encourage those, those joint collaborations and say, look, if you, if you go about it this way, in, in this instance, I think you'll, you'll be better served and we'll get all the information out, you know, providing you have a good applicant that wants to, you know, work with the town, which we hope they all do. Um, but I think it's, it's smart to kind of, I, I, I wouldn't, obviously, I agree with Lisa that I think it, this section should be removed, but I think maybe add a, a way or some way to, to encourage that um, cooperation and uh, some but all, sort of I, but all you can do is encourage it. You're I mean, right. I don't even, I don't even right. think there's a bylaw, you know, yep. that's just uh, kind of, hey, you want to make this better, talk to these people before you go into the room. Everybody knows a better meeting yes. when you know most of what's going to happen. Yeah. Um, and and I, we have been successful in just a small number of, over my tenure, uh, a few times been able to meet with other boards, mostly just to expedite good projects. Mm -hmm. um, and I, and I do think that that's, you know, I think that we're leery of projects that where, where there's some bad faith. So, mm -hmm. and, and we really just haven't had that many. So it's not, right. I, you, know, you shouldn't be legislating over the one, you know, naughty child in the room. So, you know, you could, you know, it's interesting. You can use a carrot and stick approach here, right? Because this is site plan review. So, you know, we're, we get to do it. And you could say, you know, this public hearing process you could say uh, applicants are encouraged to meet with the planning board on a preliminary basis, right? And applicants that do that and, you know, and present their plans, uh, you know, their public hearing process will be, you know, instead of, I can't remember, Chris, how many days we put, instead of 90 days, will be 60 days or something like that, right? So you could do a, a carrot and stick if you wanted, or you can just say here, Applicants are strongly encouraged to have a preliminary informal meeting with the planning board um, and or seek a joint meeting of the various boards prior to making a formal application. You can absolutely say that in this provision. Uh, honestly, Lisa, the problem isn't usually with the applicant, it's with us at this end. So I, I, you know, it's our coordinating for a night. We've often wanted that. In, in our in our worlds because so I, I'm not sure that that's not just an administrative thing that you know with Jen sitting there saying you know fielding the questions and Bob fielding these questions and those giving and then the the best thing that we've got going for us right now is building out a roadmap for a project that would help the applicant and would very much help us understand um, what the the steps were and I think you know I, I'm I don't even think we need to write any of that in. I think it's really, an, I feel it's an administrative. Jen? Um, yes, Annalie. Um, I mean, that's what we've discussed before is having that pre-submittal meeting that we sit down and we talk about what's on their plan, what's, what's needed, what's expected, what they can ask for waivers from the board. All of that is done prior to, you know, going before the planning board, going before the zoning board. Um, and that's something that we've liked to establish. I mean, it says it in the application, at least the planning board site plan review application, the special permit application, it says all the requirements that are needed to have a complete application. So that's our goal. So you can require that. So you can require in the bylaw that prior to applying, an applicant shall meet with the, you know, the planning director, the building inspector, the administrative team to review the application and receive comments. You can absolutely do that. Um, and, and let me tell you, it's helpful because if you go through it and you say, oh, look, you know, you're know, you supposed to do this, you're not supposed to do that, the board's gonna wanna see this, you didn't do that. That's really helpful. So you can actually require that as part of the application process in the bylaw, if you would like. I would love that, but that's up to the board. <laughs> I, I, that's why my hand is up. I really, really think that's a pretty integral part of this. I think this whole bylaw is so that we can do our jobs better. And part of doing our jobs better is making it really clear. And so when we have the information in front of us, we have a vehicle to have the information in front of us. I mean, I feel like that's sort of the point of what 
this is. It's not, a, it's not about like who has the power, where the power lies or who approves, but just making a really clear process. So businesses come in and understand what we're going to expect and we can, you know, blah, blah, blah. You guys have all said it. <laughs> Except that we haven't always had a gen. I'm just going to point out that we've had, a, you know, that, that's all well and good when there is a gen. Uh, Gannett sitting there. And when Bob is, I mean, he's been spectacular coming. That's why we need to make these meetings tidy um, because he comes to these meetings and uh, makes his day that much longer. I, well, even if, even if, you know, Bob gives his comments ahead of time, because in pre my previous town's experience, Bob come would the Bob figure would come to the meeting and make comment and you know, that application doesn't move beyond until the building commissioner has signed off and says that he's satisfied with the application. So I think that his time at night may be limited once we get the swing of things. So we can, we can in, in 5440, as part of the application process, we can have prior to submission of any site plan review application. The applicant shall meet with the building commissioner and any other appropriate staff as you know deemed appropriate or something like that. I, I don't, but we can make that happen. So, you know, that there's some preach. And Bob wants to say something because we've just given him more. Well, I just want to clarify that 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 has to become a law, right? Like yeah, no, it's part of. Process. I want to make it part of the process, right. right? Okay. Right. Do you feel comfortable with that, Bob? Here I am going. Yes. And well, I mean, I feel comfortable with it if that becomes a legal requirement. Like we, we had that the other day with somebody submitted an application to the zoning board. We wanted that, but pre submittal, but they just handed it in. So I felt like it needed to proceed. Right. But if, if it actually says you have to have the pre submittal meeting, then that's clear. Yep. We can, we can add that in. Would that just be for site plan or would it be for any board? Well, we're we're doing site plan review okay. right now, so you can save that for the recodification that Trevor's putting in the budget next year. All right. <laughs> okay. Um. So, Chris, did you catch what Lisa just said, or do you want yes. to read it back? So just just to summarize, um, sounds like we're talking about two changes to the bylaw as was presented to you prior to this meeting. One is to delete in its entirety section 5446, which is the section on, on precedence. And another is to add a, under 5440, a new section, which will uh, require applicants to meet with um, appropriate town officials prior to the filing of the application. We'll come up with the language of, of that um, working with Lisa. Um, I do wanna just also clarify a couple of the other things we have been talking about, if I could. Um, under section 5444, Lisa uh, made reference to the changes in the um, timing. And just to make sure everybody understands what, that, what those changes are, um, the planning board needs to hold a public hearing on any application within 35 days of the filing of a complete application. And, and that complete application language is really important because um, the clock doesn't start ticking until you have a complete application. And then the decision that the planning board makes um, must be made within 90 days of the application filing date. Um, and the time limits for the public hearing and the action may, may be extended by written agreement between the petitioner and the planning board. So that's an important section of the bylaw that got reworked with Lisa's help. Um, and it really clarifies what those time limits are um, as specifically as, as we could. Um, Chris, um, and Mary, do you need to interject on this or should we have Chris continue? No, I think I said everything I needed to say about this at the last meeting. Thank you. So. Thank you. Okay. okay. Um, we also um, just added some definitions for things that needed um, better clarity. The term land in agricultural use got redefined and the term gross floor area got defined because those come into play in the bylaw. Um, 
we um, we reworded the provisions in section 5451, the provisions for the, the lack of a complete application. We, we tried to um, make that more clear than what was in the current bylaw so that you had an ability to determine what was a complete application or not. In 5493, and this is in the, the new section of the bylaw, almost everything we've talked about up to this point, we're talking about amendments to the existing bylaw. The new section of the bylaw, which is the green development performance standards, um, we deleted again the solar access provisions there for the same reasons we talked about earlier in 5493. And in 5499, we deleted a section um, having to do with um, exterior lights and trespass of light um, onto adjacent properties. Uh, and again, there the, the problem was how difficult it was to enforce that particular provision. Um, Lisa's sense was that that was really difficult to enforce. So we, we took that out. So those were some of the other um, changes since our last discussion. Do we have any discussion on all of those that Chris just mentioned or any others? I'm just That's gonna me. say that I, I, I completely agree with that. You know, going to the building inspector and, and Jen to make sure that everyone has all their ducks in the row before they come to us, I think it'll be a much more efficient and less confusing process for everyone. So yeah, I'm, I think that's great. Any other discussion? So um, someone help me here with the, the, the motion. I think we're, we're talking about having a vote to approve the bylaw as amended in our discussion. Is that yeah, I think good? that's it. <laughs> yeah, move to endorse the site plan review bylaw with Ooh. amendments from discussion. Does that seem to make sense? Uh, I'm going to make that motion. Can I make a suggestion? Yes, Jen. If it would be, if it's possible, then for Chris to write down exactly what was said because when staff is reviewing the audio like sue's not here and when she reads it it's kind of difficult to follow the whole track of it so when you say as amended i know it makes sense to everybody that's here but when then she has to to take that and to transcribe it if you could write something for her that would be wonderful yes I, I can do that okay thank you Is, is that something that should be part of our minutes instead? Or With amendments yeah. provided by Chris Curtis? Yeah. Well, it just sometimes it takes a bit to get the minutes and then have the minutes then approved. It's sort of, if she has a synopsis of it, it just would be helpful. I mean, I can always give it to her. I could take those notes, but I feel like then there's multiple people taking notes of it. and. You seem to be keeping track of it, Chris. I think so. Yeah, thank you. So Chris, you'll send it to Anne Mary and to um, Jen for yeah, yeah. whatever distribution. Okay, so we have a motion from Anne Mary uh, to approve the solar bylaws as amended in- Site plan. Site, site plan, right. <laughs> site plan review as amended in discussion. Um, we have a second. I'll second it, Rachel Blaine. Thank you. Um, so we'll have a, is there any more discussion? Otherwise we'll have a vote. Okay. Um, At this point, we're just mostly just cleaning it up. We're not really sh shifting anything. And I think that's important for us to, as we're moving forward, we're really not, we're not, um, we're kind of got the same thing going, to be honest with you. And it's good. I don't, I'm not complaining. I'm just saying that that makes this far less contentious, which is what <laughs> you, you have all those new criteria related to the green performance standards. Right. Oh yeah. That's, that's all new. <laughs> that's good. 
it's going to be fun to talk about at town meeting. <laughs> okay, uh, so let's have a vote. Um, Max Antes. Max Antes, yes. Rachel Blaine. Rachel Blaine, yes. And Mary? And Mary Cloutier, yes. Denise? Denise Mason, yes. And Kathy? Kathy Wichoba, yes. And Annalie Wolfpool, yes. So we have it um, approved unanimously. And now if we can kind of maybe make a little bit of a mind shift and everyone pull out their sort of their calendars and their, their thoughts, um, we have a number of things happening right now. We do need to have, we need to vote on the public hearing for solar and site plan review, which we tentatively had scheduled for April 26th. Um, I'll say in the meantime that um, uh, we have another site plan review that is going through the preliminary discussions um, with Jen and I don't know, Bob, if you're involved also and, you know, and, and that should be ready to be logged in, um, I think this Friday. So um, we will need to review that site plan review and also have a public hearing on that. Um, uh, we will not be having a meeting on May 3rd. We didn't quite notice that at the last discussion just because that's um, the day of the town elections. Um, and um, my understanding also is just as an aside that um, actually, if you all recall, um, the end of last year, we did make note that the new park project should go through planning board for um, site plan review and um, that is planned to happen. So I think that's going to be a little bit more certainly after town meeting, but we've got some, some busy times ahead of us. So, um, Ugh. you know, um, it may, mightn't it be too, would it be too much to, um, for 426 on April 26 to have the public hearing for solar and site plan review, as well as the initial discussions for this other site plan review. And I don't know if it's okay for me to say what that applicant is, Jen? Yes, it came in today. The application was um, submitted from Treehouse for site plan review and for the zoning board. Um, Madam, from a from a public hearing point of view, I don't know what your schedule is, Chris, to get things advertised. But you could, if you can advertise by next Monday. Well, that's not going to quite work, right? Um, yeah, if you could advertise by next Monday and next the two Mondays, right? Oh. 412 and 419. Yeah. Have a public they, hearing for the 26th. Yeah. 426. And then it would be um, recommended for town meeting on May 21st, which would be 21, at least 21 days, within 21 days of town meeting. Yeah, you just, uh, you, somebody needs, uh, you know, I'm just eyeballing this, but somebody should count the days, but it looks like it I might did. be possible. There you go. I did. <laughs> so you could do it. Okay. And then, um, so that would be the solar and site plan review public hearing on the 26th, as we talked about last meeting. Um, and then um, we would have the, uh, the new site plan review for Treehouse on May 10th, or are we up for meeting next week also? No, for I told them 426. Oh, so we so on the day of 426, we'd also do treehouse. Yes. And we have the we have a meeting next week. Yes. Yeah. We have a meeting on 412. Already. Yeah. Correct. For access that's, that's um access departments public hearing. Yeah. Yes. Does it make sense to try to have the treehouse site plan uh, you know the initial discussion on that day? On the 12th? Yeah. Um, just to get it started, because otherwise we've got Treehouse on a day when we have public hearing on two different bylaws. I have no idea if there's going to be. I mean, for any. No, we wouldn't. We we need to. You mean to open the hearing or just to hear it? 
Okay. Just to review, we I mean we have to review, right? Just to, to review and start talking about it. We won't be having a hearing. Well, no, is this a formal site plan review application? Don't you have a public hearing process you've got to go through? You yeah. can't you can't just just kind of take it up and start talking about it until it's been advertised and it's in front of you formally. Yeah, we wouldn't have time. That's why I told them the 26th. Oh, okay. Sorry. No, okay. it's okay. Alrighty. Okay. So, so they're, they're going to come and um, speak to the select board on what is it, Trevor? The third? No, I'm, oh my God, I have so many meetings. I can't even. The 13th, I think. 13th of what? 14th, Matt. 14th. No, thir 13th. Tuesday. Tuesday, the 13th. Um, Treehouse is just going to make a presentation. That's correct. Uh, with the select board. So just yep. to give an overview of what they're doing. So they're going to select board to give an overview on the 13th. They'll have a public hearing for site plan review um, on the 26th with the planning board. And they'll go before the zoning board of appeals on April 29th. What the one other item that, you know, we had passed in our zoning uh, in our select board meeting that had to do with municipal zoning. Um, I know I talked to Lisa about that. That was another thing I'd like to see on the schedule as well at some point, as you see fit. Say more, Trevor, what do you mean? Uh, so at, at the select board meeting, we were um, looking to make a change to municipal, um, municipal zoning. Um, municipal facilities. Yes, oh. municipal facilities. Thank you. All right, all right, all right. okay. And I can be, I'm not sure where that stands, Lisa. Was that going to be ready to be heard by the planning board on the 12th? Um, so I think so. I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, there was a number of options that the select board was considering. Um, yes. So I'm not sure what that is, but um, that I think that it would be ready so that they could um, add it to the public hearing schedule. I think it's important um, given the number of projects the town has coming forward. And we, we did make a decision and uh, I'll make sure Casey gets that info to you as well, um, which option. Jen, can you please review the dates and what we're planning on having happen on each of those dates? Okay. <laughs> so for zoning solar bylaw, it will be Public hearing will be held on April 26th. Okay. As well as the site plan review zoning bylaw. Accessory apartment will have its public hearing on April 12th. And you'll possibly hear, because I don't think we have the time possibly here on the 12th about the um, municipal zoning um, requirement changes. Municipal facilities. Facilities, excuse me. And what about Treehouse? Treehouse is gonna be on the 26th. As a public hearing? Yes. Okay. So I believe we need to have um, separate motions or else one motion to have on April 26th, the zoning site plan review and treehouse public hearings. Can that be one motion? Lisa? <laughs> yeah, don't... I don't, I mean, I, I don't think you can even, even have to have a motion. You're, you're the chair, you get to set the agenda. Um, I've given you all kinds of power, Anne Lee. Um, so unless it's your uh, traditional uh, practice to have everybody vote on what's going to be on your next agenda, then you can have everybody vote, but um, it, you can kind of get a consensus from the board that you, you know, you've just, you've just said the accessory apartment, the site plan review and the solar changes have been approved for public hearing. So you could get those all advertised um, so you can have that public hearing and um, then the treehouse, if the application is in and complete, then it can be put on your agenda. Okay. 
Yeah, because my understanding, Chris, that um, we need, I, I thought we had to vote on the date for the public hearings. Is that incorrect? Maybe not. Or are you saying- This is what we have done in the past. Right? You can go ahead and do it. That's why I ask if it's the process that you've used. Everybody's different, you know, that, so okay. you can go ahead and vote on that, those public hearings. And then they know to advertise. Okay. Okay. So again, would let's start in by- So we're gonna have, I'll help you out here. Solar zoning amendment, site plan review, zoning bylaw amendment, tree house will all be on April 26th. Tree house public hearing. Yes. Correct. Okay. May I have a motion for that? Or, well, that's what we don't need to have a motion. Maybe now we're saying we, that's the plan. Correct? Correct. Okay. And we hope that that means everyone with a quorum that we were there. Okay. Whew. Hey, A22. Bravo, everyone. Good job. Okay. Um, still under old business, though. Bloody Brook cleanup. Ann Mary? I'm going to excuse myself, I think, if that's all the oh, board needs. Thank you very much. Lisa. Thank you. All right, Lisa. Thank you, Karen. Bye -bye. thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you, Lisa. Bye bye. Take care. Excuse myself as well. Thanks right. a lot, Chris. Good night. Bye. May Bye. I say one thing about the bloody book cleanup that after discussions in the office and around is that we can't go into the book and clean up on other people's properties. Is that right, Trevor? Correct. Yeah, people can do their own property. Uh, can you know take limbs out and sticks out and that kind of thing but we, we are not allowed to go on anybody else's property I, but, I, but maybe Ann Mary was researching a bit of how they do the source to see cleanup kind of thing it, I don't know how people do um, you know I assume we people go on other people's property or, I don't know if that's river property or state property or something but as, as every year people do a source to see cleanup where they pull out trash and tires and that kind of thing. Um, I, I don't know what, how they go about that, what that process is, or if they don't get approval for, for any of that. I'm not sure. I know we were gonna kind of check in on that, but I have not had a chance to do that. Well, Karen Dodge, who's here. <laughs> oh. Thanks. Has done a lot of work, Hi. actually. Um, so um, I, I think, just procedurally, just mm -hmm. so that I can get the other way. My, my internet is very sketchy, although it's gotten better since, every, since a lot of people left. That we should listen to Karen. Then we should decide who's gonna like go off on the side into a side committee and get things done and report back to this main committee. But um, just to keep things sort of on track, but Karen, why don't you go ahead and sure. present what you have been communicating back and forth. Okay. and, and um, I mean, I'm just starting. This is I haven't done any any huge amount of research, but um, I I did have questions like the like you just mentioned, um, you know, about going on other people's property, about wetlands issues, um, how people organize logistically, that kind of thing. And so um, a friend of mine connected me with uh, Andy Fisk, who's the executive director of the Connecticut River Con Conservancy. Um, Andy then connected me. Well, Andy said that that the Bloody Brook would be a great cleanup thing effort that we could do in conjunction with the Source to the Sea event. Um, and this year it's the 25th anniversary, so it's going to be um, a pretty large event. Um, Andy connected me with Stacy Leonard, who is their events and special projects coordinator, who also brought in. Andrea Donlan, who is their um, river steward for Massachusetts, and um, she's the one who uh, who I've been pointed in her direction to uh, discuss wetlands issues and that kind of thing. Um, uh, I mean, I'm assuming that that when they do these river cleanups, they're going on other people's properties all the time. Um, my thought was that um, we ask permission. Um, but I haven't I haven't spoken to any of these other women yet. 
um, when it came to the wetlands issues, my thought was that, um, you know, we focus on the garbage and uh, storm debris because there seems to be quite a bit that does back up the Bloody Brook in different areas. Um, and, you know, all of this just kind of started because I've lived here 17 years now and I have a piece of the brook behind my house. And, um, and I went in, I got on a pair of my son's waders a couple of years ago and I went in and I mean, this is, you know, it's a narrow little brook and I pulled out two railroad ties. So if I can find two railroad ties in my little section, you know, and, and just looking down, you can see other other areas where things are just entangled, um, you know, and, and, and then, of course, you know, I, I hear <laughs> I love Deerfield now, but I hear quite a, a lot of complaining on Deerfield now on the Facebook page. And I thought, you know, there's something that we can do. You know, there's some things that you want help from um, the municipal government for. And there's other things that sometimes it's it's better if you just kind of can pull together and do a little something yourself. And and so this seemed like a small enough project that that we could start something. So um, so I haven't really gotten all that far, but uh, the source to the sea, um, uh, they have a huge amount of resources on their website, which they're going to be adding to in the spring with all kinds of information. And if we uh, connect with them, we can use those resources as well. Um, so that's that's about as far as I've gotten. Thank you, Karen. Emma? Emma, you there? Oh, uh, you're um, muted. Yeah. There we go. Uh, sorry about that. Um, I'm not an expert. Uh, and but having lived on the Connecticut River, I believe there is uh, so the equivalent of a, a mean tide line. So that the private property starts. It, it, and I don't know what the actual term is, because obviously mean tide is related to the ocean, but the, and the river goes up and down and up and down. But there is a delineation which uh, that relates to private property, and so that may, and I doubt there is on Bloody Brook. Um, so so on the Connecticut River, it may be easier to do cleanup than it than it. But I I don't know that for sure. I'm just throwing that out there as a possible uh, I don't know something or other. Hmm. Okay. Um, hmm. Let's see. Uh, Anne Mary, oh. or MA, are you done? I'm done. I would look in the Clean Water Protection Act because I know the rivers are accessible to people for fishing. You can't deny someone to walk down a river. You can't. It's not considered private property. Although, I, I mean, I don't don't want to really get involved in this, but I just know that as a fact. Like, <laughs> you know, people what? are allowed to walk rivers and river banks, and they're not considered private property, they're considered accessible to people. I tend to disagree with that. This is Denise. We live right across from the Deerfield River and we, for a number of years, had access to Red Rock. And then the um, people who owned the property sold it. <clears throat> and we have new individual, they've been there maybe, I don't know, maybe 10 oh. years. And so we used to go down there. My husband actually went down there and they called the police. And I think we even got, we worked with town hall. I don't recall who, I think, you know, town attorney at the time. And they said state law difference from federal law in terms of that. So according to our state law or what they said is that they own, the people that own the property own to the middle of the river. You can be on the water, but you cannot set foot on you know on the you know maybe i'm wrong but uh, yeah and the, the same thing has happened up at um oh god uh barton cove it's the same thing same process so i'll tell you it's a, it's a big pain in the neck but i don't think that's gonna be an issue with bloody brick because it is such a small right i think right. you just ask permission of you know the, the people who live there right but right. it's it's a lot more complicated with the rivers and there? Way too complicated. 
Well, and I think that this would be part of the work of a you know smaller committee. We could take the map and look at it. I, I'm pretty sure it's a surmountable problem. Like I think that the vast majority of the people who live on the brook would be psyched to have somebody come in yeah. and you know help out with their potential flooding problems. Um, but I think that's part of the work of a smaller committee to like sort of keep it rolling, be able to report back. One of the takeaways that I got from the uh, source to see people was that municipal buy-in could be in um, <clears throat> the form of, you know, waste management to come pick up the bags that are created through this sort of endeavor. And, um, you know, as generous as uh, they feel like being, some uh, towns will pick up the cost, some won't. So, you know, sort of putting that and, you know, feelers out for that and what our community might be willing to do around that. And Mary, as you're thinking of a working group, would it be, would it cross over to other commit, other boards, other committees, or are you thinking just for the planning board at this point? No, I think that it would be, you know, invaluable to have other people at this point. I, you know, yeah, I think other people are part of the driving force of this. You know what I mean? It would be a, a tragedy to, you know, box anybody out. Huh. Yeah, it's been there's been a lot of very nice positive responses on, on yeah. Deerfield now to the idea. I've been trying to keep people up to date on on what I've learned. So maybe potentially I remember uh, at our open meeting law discussion with a question about um, what they can't hear. Hello. Oh, uh, someone. Is Hi, we can hear you. Who's we can hear you. I'm going to Lucy Chase. Oh, sorry, I meant to be muted. Well, if you have a, if you uh, have any questions, if you can raise your hand, that'd be great. Um, so, uh, if it's a working group of the planning board, then there's questions about how do we manage that with open meeting laws. But if it's a general working group within the town, you know, within different town boards and whatnot, maybe we still need. It's my understanding, and I could be wrong, that um, when we're working in a smaller committee, that it's not. Um, necessarily to, subject to the same kind of open meeting law that that's the you know that's that's the benefit of being in a smaller and doing smaller committee work. Okay. But um, that's just my I could be wrong. I don't think that's I think that's right. Okay. Cool. So. So I'm wondering. Yeah. How you know we, what's the next? Yeah, of organizing or publicizing it out to other committees or. Well, I think we should start here and now, right? Like who do we have here on hand on board who is interested in doing this? Um, you know, I am, I know Karen is, is there anybody, you know, I think that's the first thing to do. Then we can advertise it, see who else wants to come aboard and go from there. Does that make sense? Sure. That sounds good. I'll work with you. <laughs> Great, Denise. Is there anyone else who's interested in We'll always, you know, I'll always help where I can. I just limited time, but I'm definitely here to, you know, this has been a goal of ours for the town for so long to get any water we can get moving, even if it's a cup full <laughs> down the river to wait for you to be great. <laughs> and of course you can, you can go down and connect with Waitley too, because it's right. all, I think it's, it's all important. connected. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. It is. Right. Yeah. Good. All right. Then I don't think we need to have any formal action on this. And Mary, if you could um, just let us know for future agendas, uh, what when you'd like to be back on for some discussion. Does that make sense? Or do okay. So I, I'm going to reach out to Denise and Karen, and together we're going to make next steps. Sure. I, I just have a question. When is that typically done? The source to see. That's like uh, the third twenty. Yeah, the 24th to the 26th of September. Oh, of September. Oh, okay, yeah. good. Yeah, plenty good. of time. And another thing, you know, by that time, everybody should be doubled back so we could actually have an in-person meeting, which would be great. Yay, <laughs> I'm already double back. Oh, I'm so jealous. <laughs> <laughs> I'm back, I'm done. Oh, so Yay. happy for you all. I cannot wait. It comes with age, Trevor. I, I know. I have a little, <laughs> little time. A few weeks to go. <laughs> all right. And Mary, are we all set? Um, I think so. So my next steps will be to be in touch with um, Denise and Karen together and um, yeah, create next steps from there. Be in touch with the source to see people. Be in, store, be in touch with people from our own community, community 
and get the ball rolling because we don't have forever. Perfect. It feels, um, really good to be proactive and <laughs> yep. the dirty job feels really clean. <laughs> I'm really excited about this. I think it's going to be amazing. I really hope that we get a lot of uh, water moving. I hope that we pull a lot of armature for crap out of there, you know, reduce yep. mosquito breeding grounds. You know, I, I can't wait. I think it's going to be <laughs> <laughs> awesome. <laughs> okay, I, I gotta take off now, but thank you very much. Thank you. I'll be in touch with you. You can. Thank uh, you. Okay. All right. Um. Yes, and still, actually, a piece of old business that I wanted to follow up with you about. Um. If you recall, in ah, November of 2020, don't we love it? Um. We had a decision to request a second peer review. Um, on potential stormwater runoff um, at the Lascotti development site, um, feeling that potentially the peer review that was performed was based on incorrect assumptions. Um, sent, uh, an RFP, in fact, was sent out, a request for proposal was sent out by the town and a response did come back, um, but we haven't, no action has been taken on that response. Um, in the meantime, Massachusetts EPA did say that there are wetlands, there's a question of whether or not um, there will need to be some changes to the site plan. Um, the site plan also and the, the de pro proposed development needs to go before the Conservation Commission. Um, and so there are a number of things that are, uh, and, and then of course the applicant requested a continuation of our public hearing um, until our June 5th meeting. Um, so I wanted to just um, bring back to the planning board and inform you that all of this has happened and in fact, um, do I mean it doesn't it sounds like there's so many moving parts that maybe this is not the the time we would want to have for a second uh, peer review but that's not my decision I <clears throat> want all of you to sort of weigh in on what you think about that so what you're suggesting is that we wait um <clears throat> to move forward with the second peer, peer review. Right, I and I have talked with um, a representative from DRD and they were um, certainly as, as, as just informal input from the community, they were feeling that that made sense until the Conservation Commission, the uh, June 6th, 5th meeting. Um, yeah. All those things happened. So, so is the conservation um, commission meeting with them, or are they are they also on hold? I don't understand how where the holds are. You know, I don't know that conservation commission has scheduled for them yet. I I'm sorry, I don't I don't know that, Trevor. Do you... uh, well, we're really. I mean, they requested a continuance because of a new information from the um, the EPA. Uh, yeah, exactly. So I feel like we may see a lot of difference, and um, I don't know that we would put a we would want a peer review on what th there is now when I think we're looking at something that's going to change. So I don't know that it makes sense now. I should also inform you that um, there was a peer review um, that wasn't fully paid for. <laughs> so I've been trying to get the money from Lascotti for that. John signed it and then it just disappeared. And then. You mean the first one? No, there was, there was an amendment that John signed to, yes, to the first one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And they, we haven't paid for that or they haven't? Actually. They haven't paid. So guess what? We have to find that money if they don't pay us. We have we owe that to Ty and Bond. Ty and Bond, because we made the deal with Ty and Bond. Wow. And it said hey. the amendment. So it's <laughs> it's a sticky wicket and nobody yeah, keeps giving. Mm -hmm. okay. Although I think we did in November, we did say that the planning board would um, fund this second peer review. Yeah, but not the not the first other one. Right. Oh, correct, correct. Yeah. First would be paid for by the applicant. That's so the way that works. Be two hundred dollars, I believe. How and much? 
And it, none of it is paid? 72 was paid. And 62 remains. Correct. We have any teeth? I mean, I guess we're having just an informal call. Well, I, I sort of casually, because I, being relatively new to all of this, I casually said something to Adam Costa and he was like, uh, say what? So <laughs> it doesn't look great for us just because of now the litigation and everything that's happening. So well, it doesn't can we add that to the litigation? <laughs> it's not a verbal agreement or a written agreement. Written. It was, well, what happened was there was an amendment so we got a bunch of money, we paid for some, then yep. High and Bond said that there was more work to be done. Went back to the planning board, planning board said yes, John signed it. And then the bill never came in until March. I think March, maybe February, I forget. It's all the paperwork's on my desk. Um, so then the paperwork didn't- March, like 2000. One. 19. No, I know, but the, the bill from Ty and Bond didn't come in. So from 2019 until 2021, the work was done in Ty and Bond. So it was almost like Ty and Bond's fault too, because we never saw a bill. We never saw anything. So anyways, I'm working on that. I just wanted you guys to know that it's out there and I, I'm, I, I block my number so that Chad answers his phone. <laughs> so. my suggestion is that you renegotiate that fee and say for your lack of sending us a bill in a timely manner in the correct fiscal year i would renegotiate on that and then i would put it back on to lascotti okay that's what i would do i, I don't know. i don't know what others think but and, i wouldn't go for that and mary and mary i mean it's not like they haven't been an active participant in what's been happening like they haven't they have an up to the minute timeline in as much as we do so they understand the implications of sitting on it as well as we do i don't understand why they're not billing them for their part of what they know to be the understanding so chad said that he just needs to you know, go through his channels in order to get it, but they're not returning my calls or emails or anything. So um, hmm. anyway, <laughs> every couple of weeks, I kind of, hi, but, it's me again. It does seem to make sense. Well, and they're not charging us a finance charge, right? When 60, 90, 120 days go by, right? That's tie in bond. So I'm not sure. Cause I've been dealing sort of with just trying to collect it from. John did ask them if they wanted to pay for the second peer review if anybody can remember no. <laughs> but this is an amendment is what they said no. this yeah. is an amendment to it amendment. <clears throat> and that's is that's kind of squishy it's not squishy i have it signed oh. and dated yeah it's not squishy by John. okay but whether like where that i'm not sure i don't know if anybody knows where it went from being signed from john and being Relayed to Lascotti, Lascotti, like I don't know. So I guess this goes on one of our sort of open item issues. I guess because it shows up on the June fourth meeting <laughs> <laughs> when you guys all meet again. Right. Hey. And then in the meantime, balance. what are people feeling about withholding off or having? this second peer review on the information. I say we hold off. Yeah, strongly against it. I mean, uh, I'm glad that we have that in the pocket, but I don't think, you know, I don't want to be like, anyway, I, I just think uh, there's too much information that's still out there. Um, I don't believe we had a vote before on it, so I don't know that we have to vote now either does that are you all comfortable with that it's we'll just make sure it's in the minutes and that we're that we're officially holding and it's fine we're not waiting for something at town either. okay that sounds okay all righty um i don't believe there's any other new business does anyone have any 
new business or I do have one thing for the um, other business not anticipated, but does anyone have anything else to add for tonight's meeting? No, okay. Um, I'll say that, um, and Mary and I are working right now sort of under the gun to prepare the 2020 annual report. We kind of didn't realize that it needed to happen and it needed to happen <laughs> from us. Um, so in any event, we're working on, I think in general, in, in regular situations, this would be something that we would want the, some input from the planning board, or at least for you folks to be able to see what we're proposing, but we may not have that draft available and we most likely won't for all of you to see. So um, sort of uh, apologies in advance and yeah. And it is just a summation of the minutes that yeah. you've all approved anyway so it's not like it's we're making anything new it's you've all right. seen it all yeah Annalie I'm 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 happy to take a look at it and make any edits okay yeah I've also asked, another set of eyes okay I've also asked John to take a look at it since it's kind of under his yeah <laughs> I'm just happy that we won't be have have something in the report this year yeah that'll be great thank you Anne Mary <laughs> Yes. All right, so um, according to our schedule, our next meetings, uh, we're going to meet next week, next Monday night for the accessory apartments public hearing and if there's any other business that we, oh, and potentially this municipal facilities requirement, and I don't have a clue what that means, but <laughs> I will by then. We'll explain it all. Okay, <laughs> Thank good. you. And probably a few more things will pop up between now and then. And so uh, April 12th, the accessory apartments that hearing, and then on the 26th, we've got those three issues on solar site plan review and treehouse, and no meeting on the on the third. So that sound okay, everyone? All right, good. And we take got a motion to adjourn. All right, I second that. Nine. All right, and. Uh, all, uh, all in favor, <laughs> we got hands. On, I think we even see Max's hand there, don't we? I think we do, don't we? Thank you, Anne Mary. Thank, thank you, you Annalie. You guys yeah, are great. Thank you. Great right. meeting. Good. Catch y'all later. Right. Thanks, Jen. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Bye-bye. <laughs>